two are in the this morning's program. I do want to take a moment uh, to acknowledge a few people uh, here at the foundation. Putting a weekend like this together uh, takes a significant amount of time and effort. In fact, we started this process uh, last October and November. And of course, as you all know, we have to wait for the football schedule before we can figure out <laughs>
reference someone else's speech, you probably should give them credit. So those are the topics that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> The 
um, she did not question the competence of the male pilot on the way back in the same way that she had questioned the competence of the female pilot. And as a diversity professional, she kind of woke up and was like, oh my gosh, even I have biases and I uncover them every day. And so when I say come out of denial, it's to do that, it's to go towards your biases, it's to recognize that they're there, and to just sit with them for a second. There's some science behind this. It's not all just kind of funny stories. There's science behind this. So many of you might have heard of the Harvard story that talks about implicit association. There's a test called implicit association test. I took it recently, and I encourage all of you guys to, to do so. The idea, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is that it talks about when we see pictures of white people, we associate them more quickly with positive words and positive characteristics. When we see pictures of black people, we more quickly associate them with negative words. And it's in all of us. 70% of white people who take the test prefer white people. 50% of black people who take the test also prefer black. They also prefer white people. I didn't confuse myself there. 50% of black people also prefer white people. Because as Renee says, when contamination comes down to the sky, like it's on all of us. It's in our school books, it's in magazines, it's in the media. We all, we all, it's a default in this country that white is good. And so what I encourage you to do is don't run away from it, go towards it. Some of you are probably sitting in this room saying to yourself, I'm going to double down on my color blindness. I'm going to double down. I don't, <laughs> see, I don't see color. I would encourage you to see color, to see it. The problem is not that we see color, it is the values that we associate with that color, it's the behaviors that we associate with that color. So I would encourage you to go towards color, or, or go to stop being colorblind and go towards your bias. So if Renee were giving this talk, she has this funny way of speaking, and she says, I want you to go stare at fabulous black people. Stare at them. Look them in their eyes. Just look them in their eyes and see who they are as people. Don't look past them. Stare at them. And the more that you stare at fabulous black people, the more that you get in your consciousness that black can be good. And so there's also science behind this. And so what Renee says that she tells people to do in her studies is take the most, the word she uses, odious. Take the most odious white person you can think of. It was odious, terrible, horrible white person to think of. Well, think about, the person she uses is Jeffrey Dahmer. Or think about what's the guy who shot up the movie theater? A picture of him. Put a picture of him on your computer screen and next to him put a fabulous black person, like Colin Powell, something like that. And just stare at the picture. And slowly but surely you'll begin to break down those automatic things that happen in your brain when you see white and black people. It won't make you have negative associations with white people because we all have 20, 30, 40, 50 years worth of associated positive things with white people. But what it, will, what it will help you do is break down those automatic things, that thing that happened to Renee when she was in the plane and thought of a woman I hope she could drive, it breaks down those automatic implicit biases are in our brain. So I just ask you to just recognize what your biases are and then go towards them to figure out how to break them down. So number one, get out of denial. Let's all admit we have biases, uncover them, and just work on them. Go find data points that support the opposite of whatever your bias is, and sit with that data until you can break down those things that automatically happen in your brain. So that's number one, get out of denial. Number two, and again, I'm, I'm focused in this to talk about you know, racial bias, particularly as it relates to black men, but try to extrapolate to other communities. Number two, what I would ask you to do is walk towards black people, walk towards people who don't look, look like you, invite them to your communities, invite yourself into their communities. And, you know, Renee always says that when she says that there's people kind of get uncomfortable, like, what am I supposed to do? Like, walk down the street and if I see a black person say, hey, come be my friend, I'm supposed to enlarge my network. That's not what we're saying at all. <laughs> That's not what we're saying at all. But there are people who aren't like you in your circles. Welcome them in. Try. It's okay if you feel uncomfortable at first. It's okay if you say something weird or wrong at first. It's okay if you make a mistake. And what I would say to the people of color in the room, when, those, when you see those genuine, authentic people trying to welcome you into, the, into your family or into their family, let them. Let them ask questions. Even if you don't know the answer, help them figure it out. Google together. Because none of us, none of us are, are experts in these topics, but together we can figure it out. So Renee tells a story about being in New York, and she's walking down, down Wall Street, with one of her colleagues. So she's a diversity consultant, as I mentioned, and one of her colleagues is also a diversity consultant. Her colleague is a Korean woman, and they were walking around, and they were lost, and they couldn't find the woman they were going into. And Renee sees this man up ahead, and she runs up to catch him to ask him where this building is. The man was a six foot five black man. She ran up to towards him. Her colleague, who's also a diversity consultant, kind of hung back. And the man said, oh yeah, yeah, I know where 
you should go, follow me. And Brene is telling her friend, come on, follow me, let's go. He knows where we're going. And so they walk to the building, and when they get there, her colleague just kind of breaks down and says, oh my gosh, I did it. I did the black man thing. I, I was afraid when you ran up to him, I said, what are you doing? Why are you following this black man? And I work in diversity, so how could I possibly be scared for you because you're walking to the black man? And Renee says to her, relax, it happens, don't worry about it. Naturally, because I am black and my father is black and my son is black and my brother is black, naturally I am going to feel more comfortable with black men if you're not. But how can you feel more comfortable? If bias, if the definition of bias is a story that we tell ourselves before knowing a person, how can we get to know a person if we don't invite them into our communities and go into their communities? And so be uncomfortable, get into people's communities, get to know them, get to know them to the point that you can see who they are, the humanity in them. Not see who they are that they, you know, are a guy who you used to go to school with, but see who they are to the point that you know all of them. That when you look at them, you see yourself. So that's number two. Welcome them into your community, go to their community to get to the point you can see their community, humanity and see who they are. This third one and last one is going to be probably one of the harder ones, um, but I'm going to ask you to do it anyway. When you see something, say something. When you see something, be courageous enough to say something. So when, when Renee talks about this, she talks about Thanksgiving dinner. And it happens in my family. My dad is a bigot on certain topics. My grandmother is a bigot on certain topics. My mother is an ableist and said something really nasty about a week ago that I had to kind of correct her on. It happens at all of our Thanksgiving tables. Our family members say things that are wrong, and we let them say it without saying anything. I implore you to say something. So I used to think to myself, there's no real reason to say anything. So my grandparents, my uncles, my parents would sell. There's lots, there are lots of things in my family, okay? So, <laughs> so I used to think to myself, what is the person saying if anything? They're all in their 80s. They'll die. <laughs> you know, like,
early 30s black man uh, speaks the way I do, <coughs> dresses beautifully, does his job incredibly well. And so he was talking about his experience where people were saying, I don't even notice that you're black. Mm -hmm. And he said, of course you notice that I'm black. And I found myself thinking, yeah, I noticed that you're black. I don't think I care that you're black because everything else about you reminds me of me. Yep. And so how do I deal with, oh, well, you know, you look beautiful, you're lovely. It's the guys with pants hanging down and hats turned backwards yep. and jewelry and that, that I'm going, that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. So a couple things. And I, I started this all by saying I'm not qualified to talk about this topic. So all I can do, <laughs> <laughs> all I can do is wax poetic on my own experience. And so that's what I'll try to do. So in that particular situation, while you may not notice that he's black, he notices that he's black. And so the reason he notices he's black is, I, I would ask you to think about this. If you walked into a black church, as soon as you walked in, you would realize you were white. Immediately, you would just feel that you're white. You would feel like, oh, wow, white. Who knew? <laughs> um, he feels that every day. He, it's not that we walk around as black people feeling uncomfortable, but we know that we're black every single day. And so while it may be true that you don't see his color, he sees his color. And so he's constantly having to be careful and double check that he doesn't send a rough draft in that has a misspelling because that might that might be taken the wrong way, that kind of thing. So that's that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is it's how you essentially said that it's easy to see a person who looks like you as yourself. When I talked about that, invite people into your community, sometimes you gotta go invite one of those who has their pants hanging down into your community. And it, you know, maybe not go that far, but find someone who doesn't remind you of yourself. That's the only way that you can begin to see them as a human being, as opposed to a thumb with their pants hanging down. It's the only way that you can see that they're a person, that they have dreams just like your kids. And those, guess what? Those young boys with their pants hanging down, many of them grow up to be amazing people. They grow up to be doctors and lawyers. And the more that we bring them into our lives, the more that we think about black person with pants hanging down eventually becomes amazing statesman, amazing congressperson, <laughs> amazing doctor, amazing father, doting grandfather. That's who they become. And because of their experiences, they may not look in the package that you expect them to look, but somehow, some way, you have to be uncomfortable to get to know them and get to know their humanity. Other questions? Yeah? It sounds, and this is, I don't know if I can phrase this right, but I've always thought that that the way to approach race is to, to treat people as those yeah. are. <clears throat> but it sounds like you're saying appreciate that they are of a different color, but then doesn't that run the risk that you're treating them differently because they're of color? Yeah. And so if I, how is a white guy, how do I balance that? Yeah, so again, there's a lot of science on this. There's a lot of stuff, you know, if you Google color blindness or color boldness, you'll see a lot of articles about this. They probably can explain it in a better way that I can, but again, I will, I'll use a little bit of my own experience. So when I was here at the University of Virginia, even though I had a Jefferson scholarship, I was just um, insistent upon keeping a job. I, I always come from a family where you always work, you always had your own money, and so I just, I felt this compulsion to, to work. And so one of the jobs that I had, I always had two or three, one of the jobs I had was at Aramark, at a, you know, UVA Catering. And so there was one, Saturday night, I was at Honda carrying my tray, you know, with my cummerbund and my bow tie. And uh, President Cassie at the time was speaking, and um, catering stars had started late. And so normally you're not serving while the president is speaking, but in this particular situation, we were having to, to serve the tables while the president was speaking. And apparently, when the president is speaking in the rotunda, they use heavier china than they use when the president isn't there. And so my tray was heavier than normal. And so I was carrying it, and my arms were shaking. I was, you know, 98 pounds when I was in college, and carrying, you know, 10 plates on this tray. And so I'm in a rotunda with my camera running both side on. And as I'm carrying it, I lost my balance, and I fell and dropped the tray right in front of President Castine. It was very embarrassing, but everyone came and like helped me clean, clean everything up, and it was fine. The next Saturday, I was in the rotunda dome room as a guest, not going to come running with both side. Someone at my table said. You know, as the catering staff was coming around, I kind of said hi to one of my friends who's a caterer, who's, you know, a townie. I said hi to my townie friend who's a caterer. The person sitting next to me, a dean at the university, said, oh my gosh, I was here last Saturday, and this ridiculous person <laughs> fell in love. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, that was me. And I could have controlled myself. And maybe I was like, that. But she's like, no, this person, this person is like a caterer. And I said, and so I'm telling this story in, in response to your question because that person didn't see me when I was in my cover bun and my bow tie. 
She didn't see me. She never looked at me because I was a caterer. I was a person of color and I was a caterer. And so if you say that you treat people the same way as you treat everyone else, it's just not true. She didn't treat me the same way when I had a bow tie and a bun on. She treated me differently than when I was a guest in my pretty dress and I looked like a nice Halloween Jefferson scholar. That's how she treated me. And so at that last part when I talked about when you see something, say something, I'll just add a little point since we're talking about EBA now. When you see somebody say something, it's not just at the Thanksgiving table when you have to say something to your grandmother who you love and who you think is a great person. We all know grandma, we love her, but she's a bigot. Say something. I also <laughs> say something to the dean. Say something to the dean of Darden, or I'm sorry, a professor at Darden who says something crazy. Say something to a professor who taught me as an engineering student. Say something to them too. Use your platform to say something. So for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, check the calendar dance. It happens every day. And so we think that we treat people the same, but we don't. We think that we treat people the same based on color, but we don't. There are values associated with different colors in this country, and it seeps into all of us, even when we don't realize that it does. And so I would just say to you, I don't know a whole answer to give you. Google color blindness, Google color courageousness. There's a lot of studies that talk about it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. You, you were talking about kind of, you know, uh, getting different images that kind of undermine those sometimes as you sort of reshape them. Yeah. I'm curious what your thoughts are around the debate surrounding sort of the influences we get from our own history. Yeah. I mean, at Princeton, there were big protests to, you know, take Woodrow Wilson off of everything. Yeah. Um, here we have statues of Confederate officers yeah. downtown. I was at a race and diversity discussion a week or so ago, and someone voiced the opinion of, like, you know, I know Thomas Jefferson's great, but it's been like 200 years, and the